So dear, respe- <coughs> dear respected Thai, dear, dear sisters, dear brothers, um, dear, dear friends online, here in uh, Deer Park this evening we have uh, mist and if you looking up at the mountain as I came down I saw the cloud sitting on the mountain and uh, there's a I'm working on a new path to the waterfall so I was walking up it and clearing some of the sticks away and the mist was penetrating my um, clothes and so they became damp and I used what we've been learning in the 40 tenets class this is our sixth class in the 40 tenets um, to look deeply into the mist and try to understand where does the mist come from <laughs> so we we learn of course that I, am I speaking too softly? No? Okay. Other, I mean, I can use the microphone, but we thought because it's so small, I, I just speak. Yeah. I'll try to speak loudly. <laughs> so, um, so walking up the trail and having all of these uh, particles of water in the air, it's like uh, being in a cloud. It's actually kind of fog. <laughs> And, but lightly, the water particles are, are falling and penetrating my clothing. And we look with the eyes of interbeing at the, at the rain, and we know that the rain is just a cloud in a new form. It's only changed its outer appearance. And the cloud itself is, is come about is manifested due to the sun shining on <laughs> the water or the ocean and this is what we all learn in grade school hopefully <laughs> the water cycle and it's not just something for our information to learn that but it's actually a, a, a kind of tool we can use a, like we call it concentration so the concentration on, on emptiness, for example. Um, most simply, it's where we look into things and we see that they are not by themselves alone. So when we say, talk about emptiness, um, it doesn't mean that something is not there, but it, it means that, uh, or th- that something doesn't exist, but it means that there's a, um, that that thing is only made of non-it elements. So, for example, a balloon is empty, right? We can talk about it being empty, but or a bubble. <laughs> but we know that actually it's not truly empty. It's full of air. There's something in there. And the same thing is true of a flower. When we look into the flower, we see that it's made of the sun and the rain and so forth. So that's the practice of the concentration on emptiness or interbeing. And so when we do that with 
for example, the cloud and the rain when I was walking, then rather than seeing as um, the rain is just something that is uh, um, makes me wet, makes me cold, <laughs> that has a certain experience uh, of it from my point of view, that it's actually something that is uh, already, uh, uh, yeah, already. Um, it's really already there. The conditions are already there for the mist to manifest. And then this just last condition of there being enough humidity in the air allow it, allows it to, to manifest. And then I feel it on my skin and I have the experience of, of, of rain. But when I look up at the cloud, I see on a sunny day, I feel, wow, it's sunny, it's warm. I don't feel wet, but I look at the cloud and I see that when conditions are sufficient, that, that cloud can become the rain. It can touch my skin, it can touch my clothing. And through all of this, I'm, I'm using the practice of deep looking to try to understand the nature of the mist, the nature of the cloud, the nature of the ocean. <laughs> and so that nature is water. And, and this, uh, this relationship between the manifestation of the water as mist or as cloud or as ocean um, we can talk about it in a, in a on a, uh, in, in a way of, it's, it's a way of understanding, it's a kind of skillful means on a horizontal plane or on a vertical plane. So horizontal means that this, f on, the, on this uh, level, there are there is the world of phenomena. And the water in the ocean becomes another phenomenon, which is the cloud. And then the cloud, when conditions are sufficient, becomes the mist. And so things, uh, this, is, this is because that is, and this is because that is. And, and they have a, what Tai called a horizontal relationship. The Buddha often said that his awakening came about dependent on this realization, realizing that, that things are interconnected, not only the rain, but also our emotions, our, our happiness, our suffering are connected. So when there are sufficient conditions for our happiness to manifest, then we have happiness. But when the happiness, when there are not sufficient conditions, like when there's a lot of anger, a lot of judgment, a lot of thinking, <laughs> oftentimes we can't truly be happy because our thinking is, uh, is, is, uh, is uh, perfuming our experience. Last week we learned about vasana, the perfume. and how our thoughts are always perfuming our experience. Specifically, they perfume, they, 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 they affect the seeds in our store consciousness so that they, have a, they become stronger, they become weaker. And all of our life experiences are coming together and, uh, and touching those um, you know, they are, they are there latent in us. We talk about seeds. 
is to describe these latent tendencies that are there, that are the accumulation of our lifetime of experiences until the present moment. And based on those experiences, a word, a smile, or a frown, one action can be the last condition which then triggers the manifestation of anger or a smile that triggers the manifestation of happiness. Actually, trigger is not quite an adequate word. It's very, it's very often used nowadays <laughs> in psychology. Oh, that she triggers me, or <laughs> that triggers me. But it's, it's, it's very simplistic. I, I feel it, it tends to uh, reduce our experience to again to one cause so you think that one thing that suddenly triggered it <laughs> in me but actually there are many conditions that are coming together our experience and that is the the product of this perfuming the for that comes from our experiences and so our anger is has all kinds of beautiful forms. That's why we human beings and, and, and even uh, you know, human beings, we produce incredible works of art <laughs> because our, our life experiences and somehow are channeled through our, our, our um, whether we're painting, whether we're making music, whether we write a poem, it's, it's coming through our, the lens of our experience and then manifesting as a song or a poem and those poem that poem is unique is it, it has qualities that relate to other poems but it somehow as a work of art it has a its own special quality and the same it's now we're re realizing is true of our emotions so anger um, fear uh, for a long time uh, when we studied these emotions in evolutionary biology, we thought they were just kind of hardwired into the human body and mind. And fear is fear, and we all we need to do is just find the right way to measure it, and we can, we can know that's fear, that is anger. But it turns out it's a bit more complicated <laughs> than that, that our emotions can take on quite different forms based on our experiences. And so what what we call anger might be you know, a little bit different for you if you grow up in a household where there's a lot of abuse, where there's a lot of arguments. Uh, it might be quite a different manifestation in your body than in someone else who grew up in a, a warm, caring environment where nobody raises their voice ever <laughs> and we practice deep listening and beginning anew. So what might manifest as anger might look very different, to use an extreme example. But for all of us, our experiences are, um, are affecting this kind of beautiful pattern of manifestation of a mental formation within our body and mind. And seeing it like that, we don't, um, we, we, you know, I, I, I really look at my mind as a kind of canvas. Or Tai said it's like a cinematographer who's making a movie. <laughs> And it's painting all kinds of things. And with mindfulness, we can look and just experience that emotion in, its, in all its raw beauty before we, we make a judgment and say, that's a bad emotion, that's a good emotion, <laughs> and try to you know, push it away. But rather just to see like this beautiful canvas, this, this cinematographic experience that's going on uh, in, inside of us of an emotion and just looking at it with wonder and recognizing if there's pain, pleasure that is uh, manifesting associated with that emotion. And so that is already there in the Buddha's teaching, <laughs> looking at things as formations. And um, we use the experience of looking at things outside as a metaphor for understanding what's going on in our minds. So this so when we look at the cloud and we see it transforming into rain, 
we think that there's been, you know, from one thing, the cloud has become another. <laughs> so that is a kind of horizontal relationship. And Tai proposes that we can also go more deeply into this nature of this becoming that and look at things from a vertical perspective. And what that means is that we, we understand the nature between the sign, or we, we understand the relationship between the sign and its nature. So, in because we're having fun in this class and learning some of the Sanskrit words, <laughs> so sign in Sanskrit is lakshana. And this is actually um, the same root of the, the English word to look. Lak, lakshana. So, it, lakshana means the quality, a characteristic anything. So a cloud has a quality of it's a kind of whiteness. Uh, it's, um, it can be dark, grayish. It's, we recognize it as something that's floating in the sky. All of these are qualities, signs of a cloud. The word cloud is another sign that's used as a part of the collective community. We, as we agree on cloud as a term for this thing. <laughs> and so when I say it, then it evokes um, all of the sign, different kinds of other signs that are, you associate with uh, cloud concepts, experiences of seeing clouds and mountains. Every experience you've had with a cloud is coming together. All these signs so that you can try to understand the nature of a cloud. But a problem arises if we also take that nature to be a phenomenon. <laughs> because as soon as we see the nature and we think we've got a concept, we've mastered what is a cloud, then it immediately is no longer its nature. It is only a sign. <laughs> and so to, to describe this um, kind of conundrum, that anything that has a sign is, is, is not nature. <laughs> In the tradition, we are proposed to practice to investigate separately sign and its nature. So the separate investigation of sign and nature. I think I'm going to have to move the cloud. <laughs> Or this, um, Or we can also translate it as a separate investigation of phenomena and noumena.
So we do not apply our way of deep looking that we use to understand the phenomena of a cloud as we do to understand the nature of a cloud. Numina is a, a word that means a something from the, that is a, that cannot be described by qualities. It's, it's a Latin word. So a phenomena is something that has qualities that can be measured, that can manifest in the historical dimension. But the numina, numina it cannot be, no, no quality can be ascribed to it. It is, it is altogether, it is not a phenomenon. <laughs> So the tenet for this week is nirvana is not a phenomenon. but it is the true nature of all phenomena. So in our everyday way of doing things, we, like I think of myself as a kid and I would get a new, some kind of, at that time it was in the 80s and you had these little like battery operated cars and you, you could turn them on and they would just drive around, just drive straight, that you couldn't control them or anything. <laughs> And usually I would get bored after about a day or so of <laughs> playing with it. So I'd want to take it apart and look at the engine and understand, you know, I would see the coils that were, that, you know, they had these little engines with a gear on the end and with two electric, um, what do you call them? Electrodes or something where you attach the positive and the negative from the battery. And in, then I would take apart that little, metal can canister and inside you had a coil of wire that was produced that would you know you send the positive and negative charge through and then it created a magnetic field which then caused the magnet in the center on the axle to spin around with the energy of the electromagnetic field and then that caused the gear outside to turn which caused the, <laughs> the car to to run and so i felt like when i took that apart as a kid i said i discovered the true nature of that, of that little, little uh, car, electronic car. And so that is uh, using the investigation of phenomena, of, of, of signs, of qualities, of things to try to understand nature. But what I learned from Tai is that our, our way of looking at the true nature of things is 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 separate it is not it is not using the same uh, way of investigating the same method and that is you know and, and, and the difficulty is that it can only be experienced <laughs> it's not something that can be described and that's what the buddha was always faced with it's why he despaired about teaching the dhamma when he first got awakening, he thought it's too difficult. <laughs> he can explain uh, about phenomena, you know. <laughs> you know, we can investigate 
a tree, we can investigate these things. We can now understand the DNA, how the genome of different plants and animals, um, and, and go deeper into understanding the nature of, or understanding how phenomena function. But to understand the true nature <laughs> is beyond words, is beyond description because it brings us back directly to the lived experience in the present moment, which is one of wonder, of, of <laughs> indescribable beauty, of um, suchness, right? So the Buddha didn't, he, he said, how can I describe it? Suchness, he proposed this word. The Tata. It's just, it's just like that. <laughs> and and then, you know, but the students they want to, uh, but but tell me how it works, you know. <laughs> tell me how I want to, you know, I want to understand. So then he gives some skillful means, right? So mind, well, you can use mindful breathing, calm your body, calm your mind, and then embrace your emotions, be, be able to understand that those emotions are fed by your thinking and this body, but I give you some exercises so this body is not me, I'm not this body, these feelings are not me. It's not for the sake of ontological uh, proof that the, Bu the Buddha is saying this body is not me, these feelings are not me. That's a training. He's just training <laughs> us how to take care of our mind because he sees that we suffer so much because we have such difficulty to touch our true nature. Whereas a tree doesn't have much difficulty at all. You go out and see a tree, and it is a tree. <laughs> it puts out leaves in the springtime, <laughs> and it puts down its roots down, and you know, they interact with the, the fungi and the soil, and they receive nutrients. And the tree doesn't ask itself, well, but why? Why does this all happen? But then somehow human beings, we, 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 we ask ourselves that question. We want to know. But why do we want to know? And the Buddha said, well, we want to know because we, we like, because we like, we like power, we like fame, we like wealth, we like sex, <laughs> we, we like food, we like all these things and we want, because we like them, we want to have more. And then we learn that by investigating the things that we like more deeply, we can understand how we can get more of them. And so behind it, he noticed that there was this craving. There was this feeling of, the, uh, feeling of um, lacking inside of us as human beings. And so we, we try to mechanistically understand the nature of things, not for the purpose of understanding that we are already free, <laughs> that we already have the nature of nirvana right here and right now, but for the purpose of obtaining things, of getting something. And so that is why we have to be careful and not get caught in this conundrum of, of putting nature in a box, <laughs> putting a word or a sign or a quality or a characteristic on the nature of things. Because the word nature is only a word to describe <laughs> what is indescribable. But it, 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 it just is like that. It, it, ta -ta -ta. So, Tai brought this, uh, this teaching out from deep within the tradition to help us to 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 resolve our, our our struggling our struggling to understand the true nature of things <laughs> we struggle to to touch nirvana and what Tai proposes is that why do we need to struggle does a wave need to struggle to uh, to touch its water nature so in the cloud does the mist have to struggle to understand that it is already of the nature of water. It doesn't think, oh, why am I not a cloud anymore? Why am I falling to the earth <laughs> like this? <laughs> or the ocean asking itself, why, why, 
you know, oh, you know, the, on the surface, I'm losing so much of my body to the air to become a cloud. <laughs> like, Give me back that water. <laughs> you know? But that's the way we act as human beings. It's, it sounds silly, right? The ocean doesn't think that. But as human beings, that's the way we behave. We, because we believe that this body is me, these feelings are me. And so we, we are grasping. Right? So we come back to the, the teaching on grasping at the five skanda. So all of this is just is a, is a lovely play to help us to, to, to see how our mind functions in, in, the, in, in ways that bring about suffering. So this teaching of the sixth tenet is, to, is an invitation for us to, to continue to um, to make good use of the teaching, right? the teaching on this is because that is, but not get caught in the teaching, <laughs> not get carried away by it and think, oh, you know, it's all just, um, like for example, even in the time of the Buddha, there were teachers who, who got caught in a nihilist understanding, thinking, oh, the body, when it decays, there's nothing there's nothing left. It is the end of, of everything. And the Buddha was very clear that this is a wrong understanding. And we see that very clearly. So the teaching of the cloud becoming the mist is a everyday example of <laughs> what you, you could say, well, the cloud died, right? And there's nothing left. But then we, we need to say as well that the, the rain has, not, has come from nothing. And how can something come from nothing? So that is, a, that is a, um, a wrong view, to just say when the body dies, there is nothing. Yeah, and it's just the end. Yeah. So if we get too caught in this, just looking at only phenomena, and we don't touch the ultimate, <laughs> touch the noumena, touch the nature, then we can easily get caught in that materialistic view. And then we, 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 we miss the chance to actually free our mind, we miss the chance to actually become free from a, um, a dogmatic understanding of the world. Jorge Luis Borges wrote a many funny little fiction stories. He's an Argentinian writer. And one of them is uh, where a, a group of uh, adventurers, they decide on a project. They're going to map the world um, at a one-to-one -one ratio. <laughs> so it means basically, you know, rolling out a map that is exactly the size of the, the, of, of the, the land that they're mapping in order to mark all of the mountains and the trees and so forth. And that is a little bit uh, uh, poking fun at this kind of scientific materialistic way of looking at things. We forget entirely that all of our words are metaphors, and we start to think that the language itself is conveying some kind of truth. And the Buddha said, no, that is a misunderstanding. That is when we get caught trying to um, understand noumena through the same kind of investigation we use towards understanding phenomena. So it's a beautiful image <laughs> of the mistake we can make and why we need to understand, you know, separately investigate these two things. It's ridiculous, right? <laughs> Imagine <laughs> making a map that is the size of the actual planet. <laughs> what is the use of that map? <laughs> but that is what we do. And so in, in the Buddhist teaching, we always remember that the teaching is not there for the purpose of description or to try to create some kind of philosophy which then can de des describe life, but it is there for our, our, our liberation. It's there to free uh, ourselves from concepts. <laughs> and that's, that's, that can only be tasted through lived experience. Just like the wave, uh, no matter how much you describe it, you, you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot uh, get at the experience of being a wave, which is its nature of water. <laughs> It is always there in the wave. You, you, 
it is its uh, true nature. And that is also a metaphor, right? So it's not to get caught as well and think, well, but water is H2O and it's made of composite things, so that's not the purpose of that metaphor. <laughs> Tai used that metaphor a lot, wave in the water. The point is to see that we already are our true nature. We've already realized that since beginningless time. It's just this clouding of our mind through concepts, through ideas, through because of our desiring mind, because of our grasping, that we just lose it. And so then we feel stressed all the time. For me personally, when I, when I encountered the Dhamma and I started practicing, I was just so relieved because I thought, oh, this is something I don't... <laughs> I, you know, growing up and I think I have to learn this and that and this fact and when I need to write a paper about this and, and everything is, is uh, mediated through signs. It's through uh, the manipulation of signs, of words, in order to yeah, to prove that I'm intelligent, to get a good job, to <laughs> impress people with, with my, my ability to solve problems, to manipulate words. And, uh, but then finding the Dhamma and saying, this is all just there. All these words, everything that has been transmitted by the ancestral teachers, whether in the book, which is really just a crutch, <laughs> but even more importantly, through your know, realized teacher, somebody who is living every day the Dhamma, breathing like Thay, and just seeing how Thay walks, seeing how Thay talks, and being around, like just soaking that up, allowing Thay's actions of body, speech, and mind to perfume the seeds in my store consciousness. <laughs> that is the living Dhamma, right? So there are many ways in which we receive the Dhamma from the ancestral teachers. But all of them are there, not for the purpose of us to just learn new concepts, but they're there to, to as a kind of brainwashing, <laughs> right? <laughs> not in the sense of, you know, not in a negative sense, but literally to, to help us to, to purify our mind. Yeah. To, that is uh, the, the teaching of all Buddhas, right? Do good, refrain from harming, Others, purify your mind. <laughs> right now, the, the, the um, sweet sages are studying to become bhikshus because we'll have a greater ordination ceremony in September. And, and so we're studying the, 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 f the very early years when um, the Buddha had ordained many monks, but only the Buddha was teaching. The, the monks didn't dare to teach yet. And so King um, Bimbisara in, 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 Raj, in Rajgir, well, now we, we call it Rajgir at that time, Rajagaha, um, he, he saw many other Brahmins uh, and, and ascetics on certain days of the month coming into the market and teaching their philosophy, their way of living to the people. And he said, why, why do the monks not come in and teach the Dhamma? And so the Buddha said, okay, I allow them to go in. But then the monks went in, but they said, well, but we don't know what to say. <laughs> Nobody dared to say anything. <laughs> All they did was just listen to the Buddha teaching. So it was a bit like uh, when Thay used to take us, I remember in, in Thay's hut in 2000, I think it was 2011 or something like that. And the, it was a year we had the U.S. tour and there was a, a director who wanted to make a film about mindfulness with Thai as the center of it. And so he really wanted to get the film, this interview with Thai. And so Thai invited a few of us to come there with him. And then every question that he asked Thai, Thai pointed to one of us and say, you answer. <laughs> and so we had to answer <laughs> the question. And Thai just sat there and Thai didn't say anything. He just, so it was a bit like that, like the Buddha said, I've been teaching you. I mean, he didn't say that, but I can imagine like, what do you think I've been teaching you all this time? <laughs> Go out and teach it to them. <laughs> no, 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 no. And so finally he said, okay, if you don't know what to teach, you can teach. Do, do good, refrain from harm, and purify your mind. That's it. That's the Dhamma talk. 
So that was the first instruction, apparently, of the Buddha in terms of how to teach the Dhamma to, to people. Maybe we can listen to a sound of the bell. There's a, um, a book written by a mathematician called, I think it's called Flatland, or Flatlanders, something like that. And uh, everybody in, all the beings in that uh, world, that Flatland, live in only two dimensions. And then one day one of them comes off of the two dimension into three dimensions, <laughs> and it looks down. But then when he comes back, he, he finds he doesn't have any words to describe his experience. He's had this incredible experience of looking at things at this two-dimensional space where everybody lives their life from a third dimension. <laughs> and yet, as hard as he tries to go around and explain to everyone this incredible experience he's had, he just finds that every reference, every word that the he can use to try to describe it to them only is valid in two dimensions. <laughs> and so this is sim something similar to the separate investigation of noumena and, of noumena and phenomena. This idea of the vertical relationship. So things happen because of many, actually it's not just one, but many causes and conditions in the, in the historical dimension in the everyday life. A anything that we can put, have any perception about at all. Anything that can be described in terms of a sign. But the nature of things is signless. <laughs> it is something that is uh, indescribable. And it's something that we don't even need to struggle to try to touch because it's already there just like the wave in the water. The water is already there. So really it comes from stopping the struggling. <laughs> stopping continuing to, to see uh, in this investigation <coughs> of phenomena, we, we map out things, we measure them, we, we see you know, this, becomes that, which becomes this, and so forth. But in the investigation of noumena, we, s we, we, we get rid of all of that. <laughs> we let go of every, all of that, completely. All of our concepts. So, it, so we can say nirvana is this extinction of all concepts and notions. It can only be touched through the direct lived experience in the present moment. <laughs> That is, uh, and, and that is what we learn in the fifth tenet, right? That nirvana can be touched in the present moment. So this follows after that. We, we just need to notice the tendency of our mind to continue to operate at this, in these two, this horizontal level. We're just <laughs> going away <laughs> over and over and over again at, in the historical dimension. And of course, it's nat natural because we want to understand the world. So it's not that we abandon. So, right, you, you might say, well, okay, well, then I want to get rid of investigating phenomena. And I just want to go straight to the noumena. <laughs> Nonstop, nirvana, ultimate dimension all the time. And we definitely have had many people come to our practice centers like that, with that wrong idea as well. <laughs> and 
when they come out of the meditation hall, they just see some shoes there and they put the shoes on and they just walk away and they say, hey, well. And then when you come and you say, well, I think you're in my shoes. And they say, these shoes are not yours. <laughs> They're not mine. Why do you worry about your shoes? <laughs> and as, as monks, we, we get many interesting people, monks and nuns, who come to the monastery. <laughs> And they, they're like full-time, ultimate dimension. <laughs> um, actually, you know, it's, it's a bit joking, but sometimes we, it's a kind of psychosis in a way. But ac what we've done is you just fixated on the sign and the words. You're not actually touching I the, the, the nature. <laughs> you kind of have a, this, uh, you, you, as, as it, as, like Tai proposed this metaphor we talked about last time, which is the, the sugar cane. You chew on the sugar cane and you get the sweetness, but the fibers, you, you don't swallow them, you spit them out. And so all the teaching of the Dhamma should be like that. Like we don't, we don't need to swallow the fibers. You, you, when you have the experience of the sweetness, when you touch nirvana, that is, that is it. Yeah. So you, you say, well, how do I keep that? <laughs> rather than just grasping onto the words, grasping onto the signs of things. Because that can be, you know, in, in, for example, you, you, you're, I'm in the ultimate dimension all the time. You, you people, you are still in the historical dimension. <laughs> you, know, you get that kind of attitude. And it's kind of natural. We, in the circles, they call it the stink of Zen. <laughs> because it kind of smells, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you see when somebody has got caught in their thinking and they, through their thinking, they have convinced themselves that they have this great enlightenment. And then it's kind of stinky because you can't, you can't really like talk to them <laughs> as a normal person because they, they have this kind of, they're, they're grasping onto this idea of, of awakening. And that is when you are investigating using the, um, for example, the means of investigating the noumena, you apply it to the phenomena. <laughs> so you expect things in the historical dimension to be um, completely uh, uh, Yeah, you, 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 you're not able to even just use the common way of relating to one another anymore. Just saying like, Brother Min An, Sister Tan Duan, Sister Dak Ning, you say, oh, but yeah. there's a story in Zen of, 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 a, of a monk who says, uh, oh, did, you, he sees another monk and he says, oh, did you see that, uh, uh, did you see the abbot walk by? And the monk says, no, I didn't see the abbot walk by. I only saw, I only saw the skanda of a body and feelings and perceptions and mental formation and consciousness walk by. And he felt quite proud of himself. He said, ah, you know, I, I'm a Zen master because I didn't see a person. There is no person. There's only form, feelings, perceptions, mental formation and consciousness. And it's a bit ridiculous, <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay, and, you know, that is Brother Min An, that is Brother Min Luk, that's, you know, Sister Dak Nim. In the, in the historical dimension, we can refer to things in people. The Buddha called Ananda by his friend. He didn't just sit there and say, I've touched nirvana. Nobody has name and form anymore. I'm just going to be endlessly in bliss and you know, not acknowledge anything that is going on around me. That's not nirvana at all. That's a really wrong understanding. So, it's, it, so, so this learning how to look at phenomena with intelligence. This is really what it means, like using our intelligence. As human beings, we have intelligence as part of our makeup. So we can, <laughs> we can look at phenomena, but, the, but we don't get caught in phenomena and try to l touch the ultimate, or try to grasp at the ultimate through the historical, but rather see when we look deeply into the historical, the ultimate is already there just like the water and the wave.
Swabhava. It's own own nature or own own being, you could say. In Sanskrit. Swa is just it's like self referential, whatever it is in front of. And this bhava means being or becoming. So with this um, separate investigation of sign and nature, then we no longer get confused between the horizontal relationship between phenomena and the vertical relationship between phenomena and the nature. So there's a relationship between one phenomenon and, an and another phenomenon. And there is a relationship between a phenomenon and its nature, or the sign and its nature. And that is a vertical relationship. So I hope that's clear. <laughs> it takes a little bit of like, I, I noticed with this teaching when I first heard Thai teach it, I wasn't quite sure. <laughs> I kind of just received it as Dhamma Rain. But over the years, it's become more clear in what ways am I, I mean, observing it in my mind, in what ways I'm, I'm grasping at. Uh, for example, you think you get a lot of happiness, you get a lot of bliss uh, from your practice, letting go of thinking. And then you look for people in the world to recognize. Do they, don't they recognize this? What I've, what I've realized, they don't, they don't recognize is my great happiness. Like I should get, you know, this is, we had one uh, man I remember came into Upper Hamlet Meditation Hall totally naked one morning. We were sitting in meditation. <laughs> he came in without any clothes on and he was convinced himself that he had become a Buddha. And so the brothers had to kind of get up and we kind of like herded him out the door. <laughs> <laughs> the door, but it was. I mean, I'm later on, he jumped into the pond. Anyway, we, we had to, he, he actually had a psychotic episode, but somehow he also, you know, that mental imbalance also grasped onto the signs of nirvana, and he, he was convinced that, you know, he had um, become free from. I guess the phenomenal world and <laughs> was suddenly, you know, completely enlightened in the ultimate dimension, full time. And that that is a. Uh, and and in actually, because of that uh, situation of of grasping deeply onto that belief, he actually became quite violent, and one of our brothers had to, to really try to break through his 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 uh, delusional thinking just by, um, yeah, I remember at one point there was actually, he had a, one of our other brothers up against the wall and he was like, he was a big guy, <laughs> really strong. And somehow, but somehow that brother just practiced loving kindness and sending positive energy and he didn't, he didn't punch him. He was pretty, I was not there, I heard about it afterwards. Um, so that's a psychotic episode. So it's, there's also mental imbalance there. But, by, but the words of the Dhamma has somehow contributed to, to that. He, he or had become like fodder for his psychosis. And he, he, he ended up, yeah, later on feeling quite ashamed about the experience. And, but in that moment, it was for him totally real. And so that is swallowing the fibers <laughs> of, of the sugar cane. And for most of us, it would never manifest in such an extreme way. 
but it's something that where, for example, our, our, our blissful positive experiences from the practice then get tied up with a, an idea about ourself and who we are. And then we, we start to think, well, people should treat me like this or like that because you know, do, don't you know who I am, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And that is where the noumena and the phenomenal get mixed up. So a true practitioner is very humble, <laughs> like Thai, you know, or whenever we see a monk who or nun who really deeply practices, there's so there's so much gratitude for the the the, f the freedom from their afflictions, freedom from their delusions, that they only want to help others. They don't want to impose their ego or their try to get power or dominance out of their, their experience. That is how we know <laughs> there's something not quite <laughs> transformed yet. Yeah. And we can have compassion for that person too. It's not that we judge, you know, we are also compassionate because we know that that stink can happen to any of us. You know, in, in our, our need for love, for appreciation, for being understood, you know, we, we, we grasp onto the teachings and the practice as a way of like bolstering up our our ego, and it means that there's something still lacking there. There's nothing horrible. <laughs> it just means like, oh, there's something missing. There's some love, there's some appreciation that I'm not able to generate for myself, so I need to somehow get it from other people. And so, um, so we just try to be careful and, and when we are praised or uh, when, when um, people say good things about us. We just, <coughs> we don't reject it, but we practice not to, to notice if there's some attachment that goes on there. What's going on in my mind? It's very pleasant when people say nice things. We don't need to reject that. You know, we should recognize it. Because sometimes when you reject it, you secretly, you, you're like, mm, but she said that. You know, and so then when people say n not nice things about you, then you want to like bring out your arsenal of all the good things people say about you <laughs> in order to counter what they're saying when the real reality is mixed. We all have things that, we all do things that harm others and we all do things that are very wonderful too. Um, so, but the reality is sometimes harder to, to, to look at, to look at that, that complex being of doing kind things sometimes, sometimes being really jealous, sometimes, you know, saying harmful words when that is the reality of all of us. <laughs> yeah. but it's somehow in our mind we, we get this dualism. And that is also, uh, that dualism is a product of, of mixing up noumena and phenomena. So that is the proposal of the teaching on the separate investigation of sign and nature that is actually uh, from a misunderstanding of God, of nirvana, of whatever you want to call it. You know, you can put whatever word you want on it. <laughs> something that cannot be described by any quality, something, the unconditioned, yeah, something that words can only approximate, which can only be touched by lived experience in the present moment. Um, and then trying to, trying to make it something, make something of it, anything. <laughs> sign, word, phrase, a uh, statue of, yeah, in, in Christian, in, in, uh, in Islam, in, in Judaism as well, that's the, the, the understanding behind not putting a, a, some kind of representation or, or worshiping an idol. It's in there is this teaching of the separate investigation of phenomena and noumena. It's, it's, it's all there. So it's manifest in different forms in different spiritual traditions. But somehow, you know, it always comes back that need to, <laughs> to have the sacred and the profane, right? The thing that is holy, the holy, holy of holies, <laughs> and the, the, uh, the rest of things which are polluted. But in, in that may help us on a day-to-day -day basis, but if we see that as the absolute, if we see it as the, the noumena, that is where all the hatred 
between you know religions <laughs> between peoples uh, racism all of that arises because we we s we we hold some kind of phenomena to be noumena so the word god or allah or whatever you know we say that is that is holy that is somehow and and we suffer and we make others suffer because of that so this is very important actually <laughs> this teaching and so all of the buddhist teaching is is like built into it you could say like batteries included <laughs> it's like is the way out of all the teachings <laughs> but if you just you know you don't investigate if you don't learn the dhamma then it's it's you know i i, I don't experience that it's very easy to to become free because it's 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 very subtle this teaching and so all of us are encouraged to study with the teacher to live in community and sangha like we do here and so that as we grow on our spiritual path we can have a mentor good spiritual friends around who can help us when we get stuck <laughs> if you just sit at home with a book i mean it's a good start but it's uh, you know in my experience before i became a monk living and practicing as a lay person for some time on my own i saw that i would get stuck very often in certain ideas i would raise i would try to you know raise the the phenomena onto the level of the noumena <laughs> and i was probably pretty obnoxious as a young buddhist going around like as a kind of like buddhist evangelist <laughs> telling people about the four noble truths and the eightfold path and till you know my family got sick of it <laughs> and it's not helpful at all and i say why why what you know this is the teaching of liberation and because i was you know treating the sign of the dhamma as as something that and it's true nature has no quality of form or any word or sign that can be ascribed to it okay so i think that covers uh, most of the topic of the separate investigation of sign and nature Thank you so much.
please, um, if there's any question about anything, please feel free to come up and ask me about it during the week. And for those watching online, you can put it in the comments or write to, uh, to the office at deerparkmonastery.org. And then I'll try to incorporate the answer into the next class. <laughs>